Thank you so much, Catherine, for the view of what's uh, going on in Hong Kong. Um, and I'd, I'd like now to introduce uh, Richard Vine, who is the uh, managing editor of Art in... Oh, uh, is Quay supposed to be next? No. Okay. Um, Okay. So, uh, uh, so Richard Vine is the managing editor of Art in America. Um, he holds a PhD in literature from the University of Chicago and has taught at, at a, a number of different institutions. Um, some 300 of his articles, reviews, and interviews have appeared in various journals, including Art in America, Solomon Gundy, the Georgia Review, Modern Poetry Studies, and the New Criterion. <clears throat> he, uh, among other books, he authored New China, New Art in 2008, which traces the emergence of avant-garde art in post-Mao China. And subsequently, he's published a crime novel, Soho Sin, set in the New York art world of the 1990s, which I highly recommend. Um, in, in, in addition, um, Ryan has curated uh, a, a number of exhibitions in China, India, and the United States. And his talk today um, is titled, um, Ink Art as a Traumatic Syndrome. So please welcome <laughs> Dr. Bunn. Um, thank you very much, it's, um, Edward, and, and to all of the organizers. Um, I have to say it's really gratifying for me to be invited to an event like this, because as a, a critic of contemporary art, um, I spend a lot of my time seeing shows where you go in and the work consists of a pile of rags in the corner and a very long wall text explaining to you why this pile of rags addresses all the pressing social issues of our day, including racism and gender inequality and <laughs> economic exploitation. Um, so to deal today with work that is inherently exquisite, skillful, well-made, thoughtful, um, is, is a wonderful change of pace for me. <laughs> uh, however, it's also intimidating Everyone else in this symposium, all of whom are my friends, <laughs> um, are experts. Um, they deal with this work every day, they exhibit it. Um, and as I was reminded in the car, they all speak Chinese and I do not. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, ink art is the one phenomenon that I left out of my book, uh, New China, New Art, because that book is about experimental wild and crazy stuff. Uh, and, and ink art is something else. Um, so, uh, since I can't talk directly about ink art in a way, uh, I'm going to borrow a trick from uh, some of my younger colleagues. Uh, as an editor, you tend to notice trends in language, and these days I notice that young art writers in particular um, never talk about anything. All the conversations, all the symposiums, all the panels are around. And we're going to have a panel around the issue of art and public financing. <laughs> uh, and it always feels to me like you're going around and around. Do you ever get to it? You know. Um, you may remember years ago Raymond Carver, the American writer, had a short story collection called What We Talk About When We Talk About Love. I suppose today that book would be called What We Talk Around When We Talk Around the Love. And it's just not the same. <laughs> but today I am going to be talking around ink art in the hopes that at the end we'll arrive and be able to say something about it as well. Um, so the title, as you've noticed, is a bit weird. Do I just advance this to get to my title? Uh, ink Art as a Traumatic Syndrome. Uh, a kind of challenging title, I admit. Um, because I think we need to uh, address two why questions. One is, why has there been this massive resurgence of ink art as a genre? And why has it not been better received by 
global contemporary critics as opposed to collectors and, and other members of the art world? Is it just a matter of ignorance on our part? Or is there something else going on? Um, well, I would submit that one thing that might be going on <clears throat> is that ink art is a form of traumatic syndrome. That is, there's something traumatic in the background that's not being directly addressed. And traumatic experiences tend to come back to us in various ways. One is a kind of obsessive uh, repetition. You know, those bad old thoughts keep coming back. And one thing you can do is deny it or try to block it by practicing thought substitution. You know, don't think about how you lost your leg. Imagine yourself lying on a sunny beach somewhere, what have you. And I think that ink art has an element of both of those things going on. Now, if we look at a classic example, this one from around 1300, um, you know, you can sort of see all of the things that make ink art so attractive and so beautiful. You know, this great economy and subtlety of execution, the great skill with which it's created um, the sense of both the ephemeral and the timeless conjoined, uh, the flow of energy of, of chi through the movement of the forms, uh, the sense of beauty, uh, this notion that the work embodies spiritual truth, the essences, as opposed to mere factual appearance so that it becomes a, a work of wisdom as opposed to a work of intelligence. And it has a sense of, of transcendence, of going beyond this world. Beyond it, but still reflecting it, because the notion lying behind it is that this, this cosmic order, this sense of harmony, <clears throat> has a parallel on Earth. It's paralleled by good government, by social harmony, by peace within the family, by peace within the individual, to such a degree that it's even believed that the, the character of the artist is expressed in his brushstroke. Now when we look at a modern, updated version of this aesthetic, um, this one from 2008. Um, we see that a few things have changed. The basic subject matter is there, the basic style is there, and yet when you look more closely, you will find that you're seeing not pure nature, but actually an urban landscape that includes high rises and power lines and, and towers. Um, and you know, this is an interesting way of bringing an old traditional form up to date, so to speak. Um, and interestingly, it's not even a true ink painting, it's an inkjet print. This is a work that was included <clears throat> in 2014 uh, at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in Max Hearn's show, uh, Ink Art past as present in contemporary China. And one of the most notable things about that show was that it took a very broad definition of ink art um, to the degree that it included sculpture, steel sculpture, which had no ink whatsoever, <laughs> uh, video, etc. Uh, because these were taken to represent the spirit of ink art. Which sort of leads you to wonder, well, what is it that Max Hearn or other people uh, thought would be troubling? Why, why couldn't an American audience just take ink art straight? <laughs> um, 
And I think it may be that we feel that something is obscured or overlooked. And it kind of reminds me of a situation like this. I sort of imagine you know, going to a friend's barbecue and, and being introduced to this woman and um, you know, chit-chatting and you say, <clears throat> say you know, um, I, I can't help thinking that you look kind of familiar, like, like I should know you somehow. And she replies, well, you know, my name is Lorena, Lorena Bobbitt, which <laughs> may not register with everyone here, but in 1993, Lorena Bobbitt woke up in the middle of the night, cut off her husband's penis, drove down the road, and threw it in a field. Um, uh, and then what do you do at that moment? It's like, <laughs> what are you doing after the lunch? Uh, <laughs> well, I know one thing I'm not doing. <laughs> um, this might seem like a wild and crazy comparison, but, but bear with me. Um, <laughs> here's a kind of, you know, classic evocation of the literati life, the scholars in retreat, uh, you know, who spend their day ink painting, and contemplating nature, uh, drinking wine, maybe calling in some song song girls, uh, and you know, after they have enough wine, they write poems to the moon, etc. Um, but we have to remember why they're there. Why are the seven sages in the bamboo forest? Well, they're there because they were fleeing an imperial system that was very corrupt, often very dangerous, um, as depicted in this photograph by Liu Zhen uh, from his series, The Four Beauties of China. Um, one engaged uh, in governance in those days, often at the risk of one's life. So what is it that, that new ink art excludes? Well, two things, I think. Um, and this picture may be illegitimate. I, I got this picture going for images of the Cultural Revolution. As I look at it, it tends to look more like Indonesia to me than China, but I'm not sure. In any case, it suffices to make the point, which is that two big things happened in China. <clears throat> Uh, one was an external assault uh, in what is sometimes referred to as the century of humiliations from the mid-19th century to the mid-20th century when you know, China lost the Opium Wars, fell under the dominance of foreign powers, uh, was later invaded by Japan, had its own horrendous civil war and post your post war years uh, engaged with Russia cold war uh, and finally became part of the globalist system which at the time was not particularly uh, flattering to China because it was a kind of second rate power functioning as the world's factory, the place where a lot of goods were made, but not where great innovative ideas were coming forth. Um, and this bonfire represents, of course, the internal assault, those 30 years when the Chinese government uh, used all its efforts to wipe out traditional Chinese culture, to destroy religious statues, destroy ink paintings, uh, and to obliterate old habits and old ways of thinking as being, quote, futile and exploited. And now, that very same government, that very same party, is putting itself forward as the savior of Chinese culture and the Chinese identity. It's 
It's a little bit like, you know, the magician's trick of misdirection. You, you create something over here so that you don't see what you're doing with your left hand behind your back. So, right, we have all this economic growth over here. Millions of people lifted out of poverty. So, never mind the fact that you don't have any true democracy or rule of law or freedom of speech. It reminds me of this illustration. This is from Wittgenstein's uh, philosophic investigations. Uh, and it's a, a duck rabbit. Now, if you see this as a duck, you see it all immediately and only as a duck. If you see it as a rabbit, you see it all only and immediately as a rabbit. So what is it? Well, it's both things at once. And I think that has application to, to ink painting, which is both you know, a beautiful, refined expression of culture and simultaneously an implement of soft power being used by the Chinese government. Let's consider even a traditional case. Uh, my pronunciation of Chinese names is terrible. Uh, help me. This is Xi <laughs> Bashu. <laughs> okay. <coughs> who lived from 1864 to 1957. Now what that means is that this artist lived through the Boxer Re uh, Rebellion, you know, he rose up against the foreign powers, he lived through the end of the Qing Dynasty, indeed the end of the imperial system in China, he lived through the short-term republic, he lived through the Japanese invasion, he lived through the Civil War, and he saw the establishment of the PRC as we know it today. And this is what his art looks like. Now, is any artist required to reflect those social realities? No. You can choose to do this. Or this, which is one of his figures. Um, but people on the outside can't help asking what is overlooked here, what is denied. Um, you know, even Xi Jinping, who was sent down during the Cultural Revolution and spent seven years in a rural village, noted that the villagers there, <clears throat> when they talked about going to the fields to work, in their local dialect, what they said was, I'm going to suffer in the fields. That notion of labor as suffering was ingrained in the very language at the time. Um, so they were aware of it, even if others were not. But I suppose the, you know, the rebuttal from an artist like this or <clears throat> from the curators and the critics would be, well, and do we have to spend all our time rolling in the mud? Do we have to be like you crazy Western artists? Uh, this is Jeremy Melgaard. Um, you know, you say to us, why is your work so unchanging and so pretty pretty? We say to you, why is your work so ugly and depressing? <laughs> um, one is a difference in cultural orientation and tradition. Um, we in the West tend to have a tradition of directness. If you're going to make work about a severe social situation, you tend to show the starving bodies as opposed to the Eastern tradition of indirectness, where maybe you show it by depicting a shriveled shrub on the side of a hill. And that represents you know, <laughs> the deteriorated condition of the empire at that moment or whatever. Um, and also, Western culture, Western politics, Western art tends to be based largely on agon, the notion of struggle. Uh, different people with different interests intersecting uh, and trying to get their own way as opposed to the classic Chinese notion of complete harmony or yin and yang, 
So in, in the West, you know, we've had this very strong tradition, particularly since the middle of the 19th century, of constant disruption, constant change, constant innovation. Uh, the notion of a, of a cutting edge. Whereas in China, we now have a new emphasis on much older notion of continuity. Um, this is the title of the show that was at the Chinese Pavilion of the Venice Biennale in 2017. Um, prior to this, in 2015, <clears throat> there had been a show at Venice called The Voice of the Unseen, which was largely about uh, semi-traditional Chinese artists that the organizers clearly felt were being overlooked by the international community. And indeed, altogether that year, 2015 in Venice, there were about 12 shows and involving Chinese artists, something like a total of 350 Chinese artists. <clears throat> um, almost as though there was an idea that if, if you just use numbers, <laughs> um, if the West just sees enough Chinese art and ink art, they'll somehow be converted to, to Chinese aesthetics. Uh, it didn't quite work out that way. But in 2017, we had this show, and the components were ink painting, embroidery, paper cutting, and shadow puppetry. And the, the curatorial thesis was that um, these traditional forms evolve over time and remain deeply relevant even in the current moment and, and on into the future. Meanwhile, uh, Hong Kong showed Samson Young, a very cutting edge sound artist from Hong Kong, and the Taiwan Pavilion had Taishin Shi, a uh, famous performance artist from the 1970s <coughs> who uh, would do things like uh, lock himself in a cage in his own studio for a year or tie himself by an eight-foot rope to a female uh, artist for a year. These kinds of very challenging, uh, deeply disturbing performances. So I think, you know, if your official policy becomes to put emphasis on this kind of thing, you have to ask yourself, how far is it from this, which we have in the West? Now, we have cowboy art, and if you go to Santa Fe, you'll see <laughs> an endless amount of this. And in some ways, it's very similar. It's based on the notion of an ideal past. It's beautiful. It's skillfully executed. And it has behind it this kind of feeling of a you know, prelapsarian condition. If only we could return to the good old days of the open range. You know, as Jeremy Mitchell said, we've got to get back to the garden. Right? Um, but the Chinese equivalent of this, you know, would seem to be um, anchoring the current moment um, in this reference to the past. So you've had all of this stupendous social change in China. You know, the government has changed form radically you know, five times in a century. Uh, the cities are unrecognizable. They're completely transformed. People's clothing is completely transformed. No one dresses now as they did in 1900. Social mores are changing. But certain other things remain the same. Certain familiar forms and subjects and feelings <clears throat> 
Chinese cuisine. <laughs> Nobody's giving up on that. Um, chopsticks, <laughs> feng shui, Chinese medicine, astrology, acupuncture, foot massage, and now one could argue ink art. Um, providing that sense of, of hominess. I'm going to skip these two. It all reminds me a little of loving equestrianism. I, mean, I grew up on horseback. I know what it is to love riding horses. And I also like antique cars. I think they're very beautiful and <laughs> exquisitely made. But this is the world we live in. And horses and antique cars are not going to solve the problem of how to get five million people back and forth to work every morning. And it seems to me that art has to address this world or shrivel and die. So when you have this link where you, know, you go from this work in the 16th century to this work in the 20th century, with very little fundamental difference. Uh, on the one hand, you have to respect the, <laughs> the cultural uh, persistence, both personal and collective. Uh, it, it clearly expresses some felt need for a distinct identity and a, and a cultural tradition. Even when many ink artists like, take a flying leap into the future, they very often land in the middle of the 20th century, like this, which is already, to say, 70 years in the past. Now, <laughs> I'll admit that this is a personal obsession of mine. Uh, you know, there's a famous character in Charles Dickens' novel, David Copperfield, named, named Mr. Dick. And Mr. Dick is trying to write his autobiography. But every time he writes a sentence or two, he finds himself thinking about King Charles I, who was beheaded two centuries earlier. And <laughs> King Charles's head keeps coming to him, and he keeps thinking that the troubled thoughts of King Charles are somehow getting into his own mind. Well. I admit that I'm that way when it comes to the geopolitical considerations behind uh, Chinese government policy, uh, both on the world stage and in the art world. And in my own defense, I have to say that you, know, you guys don't make it easy for us. <laughs> if you remember the wonderful Beijing Olympics, uh, the stupendous welcoming ceremonies, uh, very, very impressive to all of the world. But in one sense, you know, that was the velvet glove. And what we had a few days ago with the National Day celebration in Beijing is the Iron Fist. I think, you know, there's no doubt that the Chinese leadership um, feels that China should rise to its proper place in the world, <clears throat> and that that place would be a very high one because they have the world's largest population, arguably the oldest continuous civil civilization, the second largest economy. <laughs> um, and a great record of accomplishment. Um, let's give them their due. This is a government that raised about a billion people out of poverty in the course of 70 years. That's historically unprecedented. Amazing. The other side of the coin is that this government, this leadership, um, simply wants to govern 20% of humanity by fiat without any challenge internal or external. Here's a, here's a quote from Xi Jinping, let's see, who can finish this sentence. People 
living better lives, dot, 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 will support the leadership. And there you have, I think, Chinese politics in a nutshell. Um, the party exists to benefit the people, the people's benefit secures the everlasting power of the party without challenge. And it's not just there. <laughs> this is an illustration of the new uh, Belt and Road Initiative undertaken by Xi Jinping, um, which is intended to create a sphere of influence, uh, uh, you know, extensive trading routes and uh, mutual benefit among countries in Asia and extending into Europe. So um, it's a sphere of influence, and it's a sphere of influence that constitutes somewhere between one third and one half of the world. So I think we do indeed need to honor uh, ink art for, out of respect as an expression of a, a venerable culture and a very refined aesthetic, and also out of caution, <clears throat> as a reminder of the geopolitical realities in which all art takes place. That's right. Thank you.